here you're asked to uh, find values of x that uh, make this fraction undefined. So recall that if the denominator is 0, a fraction is undefined. So we're just going to take the denominator of this fraction, which is x squared minus 1, and solve for x setting the denominator to 0. Okay, so now solve for x, having the equation set to 0. So moving the negative 1 to the right side, x squared equals positive 1. So take the square root of both sides, x equals plus or minus 1. Here we're asked to multiply these two fractions. Recognize that you could factor x squared minus 9 and x squared min minus x minus 6. So let's work on that first fraction first and factor the numerator x squared minus 9 and the denominator x squared minus x minus 6. And of course we have the remaining part of the expression. So x squared minus 9 can be factored into x plus 3, <clears throat> x minus 3, and x squared minus 6, uh, x squared minus x minus 6 can be factored into x and x to get the x squared and to get the negative x and the negative 6, negative 3 and positive 2. And we can see we bring the rest of the fraction down, x plus 3, and this cancels, the x minus 3 cancel, and the x plus 3 cancel. So your simplified final answer <coughs> is x minus 3 x plus 2. So here we're asked to divide these two fractions. So step one will be to reciprocate the second fraction. Once the second fraction has been reciprocated, then factor both numerators and, bo and um, this denominator, and then simplify. So this numerator uh, could factor out a 4, and in the denominator uh, we could factor 6x, And in this numerator here, we could factor a 2x. Making sure that our factoring is correct, we're just going to check that 4 times x would bring us back to 4x. 4 times, um, uh, 4 times minus 2 will bring us back to negative 8. And uh, 6x times x, 6x squared, 6x times negative 5 is negative 30x. So this factor, factorization is, is coherent. <clears throat> Up here, 2x times x is 2x squared. 2x uh, times minus 5 is negative 10x. So what can we cancel? Now this minus 2x subtracts with this minus or this x minus 2 subtracts with this x minus 2. x minus 5 cancels x minus 5. The x will simplify. And your choice of whether you want to cancel out this 2 with this 2 or this one of the 2's in that 4. So either way, the 2 will cancel out with one of the 2's in the numerator. So we're left with final answer of four-thirds. Here we need to carry out subtraction. 
first thing is to find the common denominator between these two fractions. Well, it's x plus 2 quantity squared. So multiply this first fraction by x plus 2 over x plus 2 in order to achieve common denominator of x plus 2 quantity squared. Remember, this here is just 1. So we're disguising 1 as x plus 2 over x plus 2. So when that is carried out, the numerator distributing the 3 is 3x plus 6 and I'm going to just throw in the minus 7 because now all of those terms are over a common denominator of x plus 2 quantity squared. Then I'm, going to com <clears throat> then I'm going to combine like terms, in this case the two constants in the numerator. So we'll end up with 3x minus 1 over x plus 2 quantity squared. And that's as far as you could get because x plus 2 quantity squared is not a perfect square and there's really nothing to factor in the numerator. So this is the final answer. Here we're asked to solve this equation. In other words, solve for x. I'm going to approach this by finding a common denominator for the fractions on the left side. And the common denominator would be 10. <clears throat> so to this first fraction, I'm going to multiply 5 over 5 to get that common denominator of 10x. The second fraction I'm going to multiply it by 2 over 2 to get the common denominator of 10x. So the numerator here becomes 15. The numerator in the second fraction becomes 2, so we add 2, and the common denominator is 10x. Set equal to 3 over 10. I'm going to simplify this equation by multiplying both sides by 10. And we'll see that the 10 cancels out on the left and the 10 cancels out on the right with the 10 in the denominator. So now we're left with <clears throat> excuse me, 15 plus 2 over x equals 3 over 1 and I'm emphasizing over 1 because now we're going to cross multiply and eventually solve for x. So 3x equals 15 plus 2. Combining like terms, 3x equals 17. Therefore, <clears throat> x equals 17 over 3 or 17 thirds. In order to determine if the data represent direct or inverse variation, <clears throat> we're going to use the model equation y equals kx and substitute the values for x and y into this equation. So first we have y is 4 thirds, k and x is 2. Uh, multiply both sides by 1 half because we want to isolate k. So here we have k equals 4 sixth, which is equal to 2 thirds. The next set of data uh, x equals 3 and y equals 2. So 2 equals k times 3. And solving for k, divide both sides by 3. And we see that k equals 2 thirds. And the next set of xy data is 6 and 4.
and we could put 4 equals k times 6 and solving for k um, we have k equals 4 over 6 which is what we had before and finally just to verify <clears throat> 16 over 3, which is the last value for y, equals k uh, times 8. I divide both sides by 8, or multiply both sides by 1 eighth, and that simplifies here as 2 and a 3, so this is 2 thirds, so k is consistently uh, 2 thirds, so your final expression for the relationship between the data is y equals two-thirds x. Here we're asked to find f of 0 and f of 5 and f of negative 7 fourths for the function f of x equals the square root of x plus 4. What we do is for each of these 0, 5, and negative 7 fourths as we substitute those values into the function. So f of 0 would be the square root of 0 plus 4, <clears throat> which would equal the square root of 4, which is 2. And f of 5 would be The square root of 5 plus 4, which is equal to the square root of 9, which is equal to 3. And f of negative 7 fourths in this case common denominator would be 4 by 4 over 4 to get <clears throat> negative 7 plus 16 over 4 doing the subtraction 9 over 4 the square root of 9 over 4 which is equal to 3 over 2 the second part B asks about the domain and the range of the function the domain would be what x values would satisfy the function. Because we have a radical, we need to eliminate having negative values under the radical. So one way to interpret that is to solve for x plus 4 and set that greater than or equal to 0. So <clears throat> subtract 4 from both sides. So x is greater than or equal to negative 4. Now that might be pretty apparent from just looking at the, ex the radical expression, but if the, if the um, radicand was more complicated, you would want to go through this process of setting it um, to up setting up an inequality where it is greater than or equal to 0. Okay, so it's clear that x needs to be where the range is um, greater than or equal to negative 4. So as far as interval notation goes, you'd have the bracket off to the left for negative 4, meaning that it could equal negative 4, and you would go out to positive infinity, but of course we cannot equal infinity, so we have the parentheses. With regard to the range of this function, it's whatever these x values produce. So if we enter a negative 4 into the radical, then we'll get 0. And we enter anything greater than negative 4 into the, ra into the radical for x, we will produce numbers that are positive up to positive infinity. So the range would be 0, comma, positive infinity. So this is the domain, and that's the range. Here we're asked to determine if each of these graphs 
graphs represents y as a function of x. Here we'll apply the vertical line test. If a vertical line passes through only one point on these curves, then the graph does represent y as a function of x. So as I pass this straight line through the first curve, we see it only this line crosses this curve only at one point. As I bring this line to the next curve, right immediately we see that the line passes through two points on this curve. And it's consistent as we move across the XY system. So A does represent Y as a function of X and B does not. Here we're asked to solve each compound inequality. Uh, A, let's look at A first. On the left side, we'll isolate X. Um, first, we'll subtract X from both sides. And we get X is less than negative 3. And the other side here, um, we will begin by subtracting x from both sides. You get 2x is greater than 1. Divide both sides by 2. Isolate x. x is greater than 1 half. Now it says to write your solutions in interval <coughs> notation. All right. So on the left side, you can think of a number line. X has got to be less than negative 3. Well, there's 0. There's negative 3. So use a parenthesis and everything back to negative infinity. So as far as interval notation goes, parenthesis, left parenthesis, and then right parenthesis on the negative 3 indicating that it's not equal to negative 3 and it's not equal to negative infinity. And as far as the right side goes, okay, x is greater than 1 half. So not equal to 1 half, parenthesis, left parenthesis, comma, going out to positive infinity with the parenthesis. So that's A, 10A. On B, Let's add 5 to both sides of the inequality. Doing so, we have uh, 2 on the far left, 2x. And this is 12. And now we'll divide both sides by 2. Get 1 less than x less than or equal to 6. Visualizing this on a number line, there's 0, there's 1, let's say there's 6. So 1, I'm sorry, x is not equal to 1, but um, is less than or equal to 6. So uh, bracket there. So interval notation, parenthesis 1 comma 6 bracket. Here we're asked to solve each absolute value equation or inequality. <clears throat> Let's begin with A. So we have the absolute value of 2x minus 3 equals 7. When you remove the absolute value sign and uh, solve for x, you end up having two possibilities or two equations. <clears throat> 2x minus 3 equals positive 7. And then 2x minus 3 equals negative 7. Let's solve the first one. Add 7 to both sides. Oops, add 3. Oops, 
3 to both sides. <coughs> and uh, 2x equals 10, x equals 5. Uh, next one, add 3 to both sides, and bring down the 2x equals negative 4. And so x dividing both sides by 2, x equals negative 2. So the solutions are negative 2 and positive 5. And now we'll work on B. Re removing the absolute value signs, we have one problem, uh, one, <clears throat> one inequality to solve, and that is x minus 4 is less than or equal to positive 9. And the other inequality to solve is x minus 4 is greater than or equal to negative 9. So adding 4 to both sides, x is less than or equal to 13. And now solving the other equation or other inequality, add 4 to both sides, x is greater than or equal to negative 5. Looking at a number line, there's negative 5, 0, and 13. x is less than or equal to, so use a bracket, and then 13. x is greater than or equal to oops, bracket mm -hmm, negative 5. So the solution is in between and including 5 and 13. So interval notation would be negative 5 comma 13 Or you could present your solution as a traditional inequality. X is greater than or equal to negative 5, or X is less than or equal to 13. Begin by removing the absolute value signs and write both inequalities. 3Y plus 1 is greater than positive 4 and 3y plus 1 is less than negative 4. Add 1 to both sides. Might as well do this simultaneously. Oops. Subtract 1. Yep, subtract 1 from both sides. <clears throat> and bring down the 3y. In this case it's greater than uh, Okay, greater than 3, and here 3y is less than negative 5. So dividing both sides by 3, off to the side we'll just write this y is greater than 1, and here y is less than negative 5 thirds. So these are the two inequalities, and if we look at that on a number line, there's zero, here's negative five-thirds, and there's one. Uh, y is greater than one, so we have a parenthesis at one, then going out to positive infinity and y is less than negative five-thirds, so we have a parenthesis there and going out to negative infinity. For the function with the graph shown on the right, use the graph to evaluate f of a negative two and f of zero.
So what are the values of y when x is negative 2? Well, positive 1 here. And when f is uh, when y is 0, x is 3. So the answers are positive 1 and 3. Find the domain and range of f. Well, the domain is allowable x values. So that would span from inclusive negative 4 to inclusive positive 4. And the range would be inclusive positive 1 up to positive 4. Here we're asked to simplify each radical expression. So in A, it's the cube root of 125 x to the 12th. Factor 125 into 25 times 5. And you could further factor 25 into 5 times 5. And we'll bring down the other 5 that we've had. So we factored 125 first into 25 times 5, and then further factor 25 into 5 times 5. This is real nice because now we have three fives, or 5 to the third, and so that we could um, pull out one of these fives. But we also have to deal with the x to the twelfth. Thinking about what three numbers could add to 12, as far as thinking of the exponents, it will be x to the fourth times x to the fourth times x to the fourth. So now we could pull out a 5 and an x to the fourth, and so final answer is 5 times x to the fourth. Next uh, is b, square root of the square root of 90 x to the fifth. We know it's the square root because there's no number written in the index, unlike the previous problem where there was a 3, which meant the cube root. No number written in the here where the index would be. Uh, it implies a square root. So we could factor the 90 into 9 times 10. Oh, the problem was actually x to the fifth, now that I'm looking at it closer. Okay, there. 9 times 10 times x to the fifth. So uh, we could think about get creative about factoring out the x to the fifth with the anticipation of um, a square root. So let's try x to the x squared times x squared times x to the first power. This adds to, to 5. Now why am I doing x squared and x squared? I could have done x squared next to the third, but doing 2x squared allows me to pull one of these out, and so I can also factor the 9 as 3 times 3, so I'll just rewrite everything. So I could pull out a 3 and I could pull out an x squared. So and leave the 10 and the x under the radical. So final answer is 3x squared times 10 times x. And finally, uh, with uh, c, we have the square root of 6w and the square root of 22w. I'm going to factor the 6 and the 22 before I combine these radicals. And so we could simplify the math. We could multiply the 6 and the 22 and combine the radicals into 1. But I'm going to factor the 6 into 2 and 3 and leave the w, of course, and then factor the 22 into 2 and 11, and the w stays. And I can see now that I have radical 2 and radical 2, which I could combine and just say, okay, the square root of 4, and what's 
well, leaves behind the square, uh, the square root of 3 times 11, which is 33. But then I have w times w under the radical, which is the square root of w squared. So now I can see the square root of 4 is 2. The square root of w is w, and then what's left behind is the square root of 33. Our final answer. Here we're asked to simplify uh, or write each expression using radical notation. I like to make some more sense of this negative exponential, uh, break it into its two components, that is numerator and denominator. So y over x raised to the negative 1 times 1 over 3, because we could multiply 1 third times negative 1 to get a negative 1 third. Why am I doing that? Because I want to make sure I understand what the radical, what the exponential is asking me to do. So recall this part in instructs us to reciprocate this or put it under 1. So we could write 1 over y over x in the denominator. Now this gets simplified to x over y. Well, why is that? Simplifying a complex fraction, multiply the whole fraction, in this case, by 1, and we're going to disguise 1 as x over x. Why is that? Because this x will cancel out, and we're left with x over y. And we can't forget about this one-third. So what does that mean? It means the cube root. Well, I could write the cube root using a radical symbol. And I put a 3 here, so the final answer is x over y, the cube root of. In b, we're asked to um, write 5x to the 3 fourths using radical notation. The 5 is separate from the exponential, so it's x to the 3 fourths. So I'm going to just pull out the 5 a little bit, leave a little distance there, and just emphasize that it's x and it's 3 times 1 fourth. Well, what does this mean? It means x cubed and take the fourth root of x cubed. So the 5 again is separate from that. So I'm going to rewrite this as the fourth root and x cubed. So that 1 fourth means the fourth root and the cube stays with the x. Here in 15a and b, uh, simplify each expression. We'll look at a first. Here we have um, this entire term in parentheses with a cube. Uh, third power. So um, if we look at, if we apply this cube to each of the terms in here, so if we can micromanage this, it would be 2 cubed x to the 4 thirds cubed y, and this will be cubed, which will be y to the ninth. So 2 cubed is 8 x to the fourth x to the 4 thirds cubed would be simply x to the fourth, and then we have the y to the ninth. Now let's just let me talk about this real quick. Why does this all of a sudden become x to the fourth? Um, a couple ways of thinking about it, but I like to think of it like x to the in this case x to the four thirds, and we're cubing it, we're meaning we multiplying it by itself three times. 
And what do you do when you have common bases? You add the exponents. Okay. Common denominator is 3. So that's 3. And 4 plus 4 plus 4 is 12. Well, what is 12 over 4? I mean 12 over 3. It's 4. So there is the x to the fourth. Here we have 7 outside of the radical and a 3 outside of the radical because the radical applies, or the exponent, excuse me, the exponent applies to the w and the, this exponent applies to the w here. So we could combine the 7 and the 3 safely and multiply them and get 21. And we have common base w with two exponents and we could rewrite it as 2 plus 3 halves as the exponential part. Uh, rewriting this again, we have w and the common denominator here and the exponential is 2, so this is 4 plus 3 over 2. And if we combine those two terms in the numerator, 21 w to the 7 halves, and that's as far as we could get. Here we're asked to add these radicals. <clears throat> if we can, let's try to find a common radical, sort of like a common denominator. Well, let's see if we could get a 3x out of 12x. So if we factor the 12x into 4 times 3 times x, bring the radical the 5, we can see that we could take the square root of 4 which will pull out a 2. So taking a 2 out of this, multiplying it by 5, gives us 10 times 3x plus uh, square root of 3x. And it's known that this is a 1 in front of the 3x, excuse me, <coughs> coefficient. So if we add 1 and 10, we get 11. So the final answer is 11 square root of 3x. Number 17, we're asked to um, <clears throat> solve the radical equation. Well, let's get rid of the radical by cubing both sides. So if we do this, if we cube the left side, we'll just remove the radical symbol, and so we'll get 3x minus 1. If we cube the right, which, uh, you know, is 2 cubed, 2 times 2 times 2, is 8. Now we just use algebra to solve for x, add 1 to both sides, and 3x equals 9, divide both sides by 3, and x equals 3. Number 18, we're asked to determine the length of a side of a triangle. The hypotenuse is the longest side of the triangle and it's directly across from the right angle and these are the two lengths of the shorter sides and one side is 7, the length of one side is 7, the hypotenuse is 10 and we're asked to determine the length of the other side. We could use <clears throat> the Pythagorean theorem or the distance equation which is c squared equals b squared plus a squared a and B are the length of the two shorter sides, and C is the length of the hypotenuse. We're just going to substitute the numbers in and solve for a side. So uh, 10 squared, and that will be for C, equals our choice as far as choosing what's letter, but we could go 7 squared plus A squared. So it would be 100 equals 49. <clears throat> plus a squared. Solve for a. Uh, bring the 49 to the left side, or subtract 49 from both sides of the equation. So here we have 51 equals a squared. And square take the square root of both sides. So a, just going to reverse this just for presentation purposes, a equals the square root <clears throat> of 51. Number 19, we're asked to use algebra to solve 
the radical equation. So to clear that radical, and this is a square root, um, so we're going to square both sides. In doing so, that clears the radical on the left side, so it's 2x plus 19 equals x plus 2 squared. We'll just FOIL x plus 2 to get x squared plus the middle term 4x plus that last term 4. And uh, now we proceed and um, isolate a, a uh, quadratic equation. So we need to bring the 2x over to the, to the right side, or let's subtract 2x, and we could simultaneously subtract 19 from both sides. That would give us 0 equals x squared plus 2x, and this is minus 15. Now we could factor the right side, x and x to get the x squared, and to get negative 15 and the positive 2 middle term, be positive 3 minus 2. Uh, minus 5. To get the middle term, positive 2, it would be positive 5 and minus 3. So to solve for the x values, we're going to set each of these factors, set each of them to 0. So I'm just going to make it easier for me to write. I'll put this on the right side. x plus 5 equals 0. And so it's pretty apparent that x would be negative 5 here. And the other solution would be x minus 3 equals 0. And proceeding to isolate x, x equals positive 3. So the two solutions are x is negative 5 and x is positive 3. And if you were to plot this polynomial, or this quadratic, the curve of the parabola would intersect the x-axis at negative 5 and positive 3. Here we're asked to determine a variety of items for this particular quadratic function, <clears throat> 2x squared minus 3x plus 9. First we need to determine the vertex. Um, one way to go about that is to use the formula uh, h, which is the x-coordinate of the vertex, is minus b over 2a. So we're going to substitute in uh, negative 3 here and 2. So the x-coordinate of the vertex is positive 3, because when you substitute in the negative 3, you'll get a positive 3. And 2 times 2 is 4. So that's part of it. To determine the y um, coordinate for the vertex, we're going to substitute the 3 fourths into the quadratic and determine the y coordinate. So 2 times 9 over 16, that is 3 fourths squared, minus 3 times 3 over 4 plus 9. So we can simplify the 2 and factor out the 2, simplify that and get 1. So this will be 9 over 8 um, minus 9 fourths plus 9. Adding these terms, the common denominator is 8, so this will be 9 plus 2 times 9 is 8, or excuse me, subtract, oops, minus 18, and plus uh, 9 times 8 is 72. This is all just common denominator determination for, the, for each individual term. And the denominator is 8, of course, 9 eighths. And then if we simplify this, 8 over 18 over 8, Factor out the 2, you get the 9 fourths back, and then 72 over 8 will be back to 9. Adding these, you get 63 over 
8. So the coordinates for the vertex are 3, 3 fourths and 63 over 8. The axis of symmetry is the x value, so it's the axis of symmetry is 3 fourths. This parabola opens upward because there's a positive coefficient in front of the x squared, and because of that the parabola will look something like this. So therefore there is a minimum, and the minimum is the y value of the vertex, which is 63 over 8. I encourage you to plot this on your calculator, and you'll see what the parabola looks like. You can see it has no real solutions, number one, and you can see that it opens upward and that the vertex is at the uh, coordinates that we determined. In 21, we're asked to utilize the graph to the right to solve the equation ax squared plus bx uh, plus c equals zero, a quadratic. When, a, when the quadratic is set to zero, equal to zero, the solutions for the quadratic are the x values of where the curve crosses the x-axis, in other words, the x-intercept. When y is zero, there's an x-intercept potentially. Here, the curve crosses the x-axis at two points, positive three and negative four. So the solutions to the quadratic are positive 3 and negative 4. Here in 22 we're asked to solve the quadratic equation using the quadratic formula. A is positive 3, B is negative 4 because I've subtracted 4x from both sides, and C is positive 2 because I added positive 2 to both sides to get all three terms on one side of the equation and set the quadratic equal to zero, which is important to do before you use the quadratic equation. So identify a, b, and c, substitute them in the quadratic. The quadratic general formula is right here. So negative b would be positive four plus or minus the square root of b squared, which is 16, uh, minus four times a, times c and minus 4 times 3 times 2 and so this is 6 or 2 times 12 which is 24 so oops and we got to remember the denominator 2a uh, 2a is 2 times 3 is 6 so next 4 plus or minus 16 minus 24. As you can see, we have a negative under the radical and divided by 6 just to carry this down. Then next, 4 plus or minus the square root of 8, actually negative 8. So divided by 6, and uh, I'm going to write this off to the side because I'm losing some of my window. So we could simplify 4 over 6 as 2 thirds, 2 over 3, and we have plus or minus um, the square root of negative 8 and we can bring out i because i is the square root of negative 1 so it's i and the square root of 8 but then we could factor 8 into 4 times 2 so 2 thirds plus or minus i times 4 times 2 <coughs> excuse me and ultimately we're going to have another, losing my, some room here, but we could pull out a 2 from the square root of 4, so this is 
4 thirds plus or minus i times the square root of 2. Uh, here's the final answer because I came off the screen. So, um, yeah, pulling out the uh, 2 from the square root of 4, you get 2 times 2, which is 4. So 4 thirds plus or minus i square root of 2. Here in 22, we're asked to solve the quadratic equation using the quadratic formula. First, rearrange the equation to set the quadratic equal to 0. So I end up with 3x squared minus 4x plus 2 equals 0. This is very important before you proceed to solve the quadratic equation using the quadratic formula. So now we're going to substitute a, b, and c. So um, minus b is 4 plus or minus the square root of b squared, which is 16 minus 4 times 3 times 2 uh, divided by 2a which is 6 6 excuse me um, completing the math under the radical plus or minus 16 minus 24 we see we have a negative in the radical so we're going to have an imaginary answer solutions divided by 6. Um, still working in the radical because we cannot simplify yet because these two terms are separated by an addition subtraction so you can't simplify 4 6 yet. So continuing with the math plus or minus this is the square root of negative 8 over 6. We could pull out a i because the square root of negative 1 is i, so 4 plus or minus i times the square root of 8 divided by 6. Still cannot simplify uh, yet. So I'm going to move over to the right and now I'm going to factor the 8 into just 2 and 4. And knowing that I could pull out a 2 because now it's 4 plus or minus i times 4 times 2 over 6 and uh, I could pull out that square root of, or the square root of 4 which is 2 so this is 4 plus or minus 2i times the square root of 2 all over 6 and I'm going to go up here <laughs> now I could factor a 2 from that from the 4 and this term this is an entire collective term so 4 plus or minus 2y square root of 2 I'm going to factor out this 2 and a 2 from the 4 so that leaves me with 2 times 2 plus or minus i times the square root of 2 over 6 so if I distribute this 2 I'll get I'll get back what I have here in the numerator 2 times 2 is 4, 2 times i root 2 is 2i root 2. I could simplify this now because I, this is this quantity or these terms are in parentheses and the 2 is outside of that. I could simplify the 2 and it will be 2 plus or minus i square root of 2 over 3. Here we're asked to, to identify the vertex of a quadratic function and I wrote here the general form for the vertex form of a quadratic function. So what was given to us was negative quantity x plus 2 squared minus 1 and this fits into the quadratic or the uh, um, vertex form very nicely. Um, so here uh, h is negative 2. Why is it negative 2? Because if we substitute a number into h it must produce 
these values in the parentheses. So we have x, and the only thing that's going to produce a positive 2 if we substitute a value in for h is negative 2, because negative 2 multiplied by a negative gives you positive 2. So you have to account for that negative sign there. And k is negative 1. So the vertex is negative 2 comma negative 1. I'm going to solve this quadratic using the by completing the square. So I'm going to set it equal to 0. So 3x squared minus 5x minus 2 equals 0. Then I'm going to divide everything by 3. So that way I'll have a uh, 1 in front of the x squared. So that brings me to this step. X squared minus 5 thirds x minus 2 thirds equals 0. Then I'm going to proceed and complete the square and I'm going to uh, to do that I'm going to take 5 thirds, divide it in half, and then square it. So if we were to take 5 thirds, multiply it by 1 half, because that's essentially what we're doing when we say divide it by 2, uh, we'll have 5 6. That's negative 5 6, but we need to square that. So we're going to add and subtract 5 6 from this side of the equation. So x squared minus 5 thirds x. And in this case, we're going to add um, 25 36, because that's 5 6 squared. And then we're going to subtract 25 over 36 and subtract the 2 thirds, <coughs> set it equal to 0. All right. Now I'm going to work with this part of the equation and determine the perfect square for that. So let's set up two parentheses, sets so of parentheses x, x, and then we're going to notice that we could put a 5 and a 6 to get 25, 36 back. So subtract, subtract. And so our perfect square is x minus 5 6 quantity squared. Uh, and then we're going to bring these other two terms to the right side. And it'll be 25 over 36 plus two-thirds. Now that looks kind of messy, and it is, but let me move uh, this over to get some more paper, and now I'm going to work with what we have left. So x minus 5, 6 squared equals 25 over 36 plus two-thirds. And we need to combine these two fractions. All right. So the common denominator is 36. So I'm going to continue to write what's on the left side. So the common denominator is 36. So 25. In order to get 36 for this term, we're going to multiply top and bottom by 12. So that's uh, 24. So 2 times 12 is 24. Now, it's kind of neat. Don't get scared because we have a square root, and this is going to be 49 over 36. So that's really slick. So now we have perfect squares on both sides. And give me some more paper, some more room. And take the square root of both sides, x minus 5, 6 equals plus or minus 49, oops, yeah, square root of both sides, 7 over 6, because we're taking the square root of both sides, so that's 7 and 6. So now we're going to isolate x, so x equals plus or minus 7, 6 plus 5, 6. And so we have to uh, deal with this in both plus or minus. So 
We have a common denominator, which is really nice. So in one case, it's going to be 7 plus 5 over 6, which simplifies to 12, 6, which is equal to 2. The other answer is x equals negative 7 plus 5 over 6, which equals negative 2 sixths, which is 1 third, negative 1 third. So the two answers are 2 and negative 1 third. I encourage you to um, <clears throat> take these two values and substitute them back into the original quadratic and set it equal to 0 and verify that you'll get 0 for both of those solutions. Here we're asked to determine the formula for the linear function. <clears throat> mx plus b. So given the data here and the assumption is that it's linear, you could take any two points and use them to determine the slope m. The y-intercept b is the y value when x is 0. So when x is 0 right here, y is 4. So b is 4 and now we have to determine the slope. Seems to be the easiest to use these two points here, 0, 4, and 2, 0. The slope, as you recall, is the change in y over the change in x. So in this case, y is uh, 4 and 0, or 0 and 4, however you want to uh, put them in the order. So we'll just use the conventional y2, so we'll go 0 minus 4, and then um, the denominator is the change in x, which is 2 minus 0. And this is negative 4 over positive 2, which is negative 2. So the function is y equals negative 2x plus 4. Here we have a modeling problem where a quadratic function negative 16t squared plus 44t plus 4 represents the um, path of a stone as it's thrown upward four feet above the ground. This value of 4 here, the C term, is the y-intercept because when t or x, when t is 0 at the initial time when the stone is thrown, the height of the stone is 4. You can see these two terms go out and you have 4 left because h of t, h is the height at a particular time. So at t0, the height is 4. So it's nice to get a, a feel of what this parabola looks like. But, but before I show you what it looks like on the calculator, predict what it would look like. The parabola would open downward because of the negative sign in front of the a t squared term. The parabola would cross the y-axis at 4 because when t is 0, as we said before, uh, these two terms go out and so the curve intersects the y-axis at 4, 4 feet in this case. So this is what the parabola looks like if you plot it on your calculator. And I plotted a horizontal line 32 feet because part A asks about how many seconds does the stone first reach a height of 32 feet. Well, the height of 32 feet is that horizontal line, and that would be a y equals 32 uh, equation. So if you want to plug this into your calculator, you can see that the first equation is the parabola and the second equation is y equals 32. I did that so you could really see uh, the path of the stone as it travels upward and then downward and notice that uh, at 32 feet the, the stone travels past 32 feet, the height of 32 feet, twice. First on its upward journey to the maximum and then second it hits 32 feet at its downward journey um, as, it hits the, as it heads towards the ground. So the question is after how many seconds does the stone first reach a height of 32 feet? Because the parabola crosses 32 feet at two points we will get two solutions when we plug in 32 feet for the height. So let's do part A. Let's substitute 32 feet in for h of t and solve for t. And again, because there's because the
parabola crosses 32 at two points, we'll get two solutions or two answers for t. We want the smaller value of t, which is when the um, stone first reaches 32 feet. So 32 equals negative uh, 16 t squared plus 44 t plus 4. So to solve for this, um, we set a quadratic equal to 0 and then proceed. So I'm going to subtract 32 from both sides. So 0 equals negative 16t squared plus 44 minus 28. Well, I like to get rid of these negative signs, particularly the one in front of the um, 16t squared term. So um, I'm just going to bring everything to the other side, so to speak, or subtract 16t squared minus 44 and minus 28, subtract those. So um, I'll just rewrite things as 16t squared minus 44 plus 28. You could proceed to factor this quadratic as is, but let's simplify this. Let's divide everything by 4 to now get 4t squared minus 11 plus 7. Now at this point we could proceed um, a couple ways. We could um, use the grouping method and then factor or we could use uh, the technique of completing the square. Let's try to um, use the grouping method. So with the grouping method recall you multiply a times b which is 28 and then what factors of 28 will equal negative 11 when added? What two factors of 28 when added will equal negative 11? Well, to get positive 28, we need to multiply um, two negative numbers, and then those two negative numbers must add up to uh, negative 11, and it seems to me it's right here, negative 4 and negative 7. So I'm going to break up, oh, I forgot the T here, the whole way down. So I'm going to break up negative 11t uh, as follows. 4t squared minus 4t minus 7t plus 7. So now I'll proceed and factor this group and then this group here. So I could factor out a 4t mm -hmm, from the first group And then from the second group, I'm going to put a negative sign here, and then I'm going to factor out a 7. Then I could leave in the parentheses a t, and now this is going to be a negative, set, uh, negative 1. Negative 1. Why is that? Because this here, this distribution must produce these original terms, and let's verify that. Negative 7 times t produces negative 7t. Negative 7. Uh, times a negative 1 produces positive 7. Now you see we could factor uh, t minus 1, factor out t minus 1, and what we're left with is 4t um, minus 7. And then this is all equal to 0. So now we have two factors that are set equal to 0. And now we could proceed and set each factor to 0 and then solve for t. So t minus 1 is 0. So 1 time at 32 feet is 1 second. The other time at 32 feet would be determined by using 4t minus 7. And so now 4t equals 7. So t equals 7 fourths. 7 fourths, of course, is greater than 1. So the first time at which the stone reaches 32 feet is one second. The second time the stone reaches 32 feet is 7 fourth seconds, or 1 and 3 quarter seconds. The second part B asks to, us to determine the maximum height of the stone and the time at which it reaches this height. So that problem 
is asking you really to get the quadratic and vertex form to determine the um, coordinates of the vertex. So recall that the x coordinate of the vertex, or in this case, the time, the time coordinate of the vertex for our purposes, we'll say x equals time, and that that equation is negative b over 2a. So this in this case it's negative 44. So you can see this nicely. The two negatives cancel out to make a positive time, which makes physical sense. The the time, the maximum height. If we simplify this, is 11 over 8 or 11 eighths. And we'll leave it that way because it says do not round your answers. So we'll leave it as a fraction, 11 eighths. Now what we do with this time is we substitute it back into the quadratic. Now to determine the, <coughs> the height at time 11 eighths, substitute, substitute 11 eighths into the function. So now we have the h or h of 11 eighths, height at 11 eighths seconds. So um, now it's 11 eighths squared times negative 16, 11 eighths times 44 plus 4. Now unlike before, um, don't proceed and simplify or try to remove the negative um, from the right side because you'll just have to divide the left side by a negative 4. So just leave the quadratic um, function as is with the number substituted and solve for <clears throat> this actual height because when you're solving for real physical values um, in this case you don't want to simplify this because you'll have to do it to the left side and then you'll have to undo that simplification to get your final answer. So uh, I'll let you substitute this in your calculator and then you'll determine that the answer is 34.25 feet so the, the coordinates of the vertex are 11 eighths, 